of webcasts, along with the ones earlier this fall, are funded by the Foundation for Criminal Justice and the Ford Foundation. Now, today's session in particular is presented in partnership with the National Juvenile Defender Center and utilizes some of their lessons, which we're going to explain shortly. And the main goal for this series of webcasts um, presented by NACDL and all of our partners is to provide resources for attorneys who represent juveniles in adult court, to provide them as an online, on-demand, ongoing resource that can be accessed anytime by lawyers who consistently represent juvenile clients or those who just find themselves with a juvenile case and need some additional instruction. We're very excited to have a live audience watching us today, but also we would like to tell everyone watching to let their colleagues know all of these trainings will be available on demand on the NACDL website along with the earlier trainings. So we don't want to leave anybody out. Everyone can watch on demand whenever they want to. Now I'm going to introduce Catherine Crawford. Catherine has done an excellent job of organizing this series of webcasts for NACDL, and we're very pleased to have her here today to introduce the program. So I'll tell you a little bit about Catherine, and then she will tell you a little bit more about our faculty today. Catherine has been representing indigent defendants and training attorneys across the country for over a decade. From 1998 to 2011, Ms. Crawford served as a clinical professor and a staff attorney at Northwestern University School of Law, where she represented clients in juvenile delinquency proceedings and criminal matters, including capital, at all stages of the proceedings, trials, appeals, and post-conviction. Ms. Crawford took leave from Northwestern in 2007 to serve as the inaugural director of the Juvenile Regional Services, a not-for-profit public defender office providing holistic representation to indigent youth charged in delinquency court in Orleans Parish, Louisiana. She took another leave from 2008 to 2010 to join the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, where she oversaw Models for Change, a multi-state juvenile justice reform initiative. She's the editor of Promise Unfulfilled, Juvenile Justice in America, and she co-wrote and edited both the Juvenile Training Immersion Program and the National Juvenile Defense Standards, which are two cutting-edge juvenile defense initiatives created by the National Juvenile Defender Center. So without further ado, I present Katherine Crawford. Thank you. Um, I'm so pleased that NACDL and our partners um, have committed to presenting this webinar series for you. Um, all of the organizations that are sponsoring this webinar series today have a demonstrated commitment to protecting and advancing the rights of youth who are charged in delinquency and criminal courts. Um, we joined together to present this webinar series to help defenders understand and explore how the significant advances in adolescent brain and behavioral development research is, can influence our practice. Um, there's been increased recognition by the courts of the relevance of this research at all stages of the proceedings, from the attorney-client relationship to bail decisions, motions practice, culpability, and sentencing. And the successes that we have seen in the United States Supreme Court, as well as state courts across the country, helps illustrate the opportunity that we have to bring the law further into line with the research, because age does matter. Now, this three-part webinar um, is one today and two tomorrow. Today, we're going to be talking about communicating with clients, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Tomorrow, we'll be presenting a webinar on incorporating <coughs> adolescent development and behavioral research into all stages of the proceedings, and then we'll focus on bail and sentencing in particular. Today's session is especially exciting because it's the premiere of the juvenile <coughs> training immersion program that's created by the National Juvenile Defender Center. Um, the National Juvenile Defender Center has provided support to and to and built the capacity of defenders representing juvenile clients um, and has developed a substantial amount of resources that can be used by defenders in both delinquency and adult criminal court. Um, in addition to the Juvenile Training Immersion Program, which we call JTIP, the National Juvenile Defender Center has created the National Juvenile Defender Standards, which will be released this fall. 
I just want to talk briefly about JTIP. Um, one of the principal authors is Chris Henning, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, JTIP is a comprehensive juvenile defending, defender training curriculum um, with trial advocacy strategies and substantive law designed to present defenders with skills necessary to provide quality defense to youth. There are 40 lessons with interactive um, exercises at the end, and as I said, these will be published in the fall and available through the website <coughs> njdc.info. Um, now, today's session is led by Chris Henning and Dr. Jen Woolard. Um, Chris Henning is, her full bio can be accessed on the web. Um, it is entirely too voluminous to um, a recount here. Um, as will Dr. Um, as is Dr. Jen Woolard's. Um, Chris is a professor of law and co-director at the Juvenile Justice Clinic at Georgetown Law School. She, in 1997, she joined the staff of the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia, where she represented clients and helped organize a juvenile unit designed to meet the multidisciplinary ne disciplinary needs of children in the juvenile justice system. Um, she, in addition to representing clients at all um, levels, she has trained um, attorneys across the country. She's written a number of law review articles on the role of child's counsel, the role of parents in delinquency cases, confidentiality, um, and criminalizing normal adolescent behavior in colors, uh, communities of color. In 19, 2000, she um, received the Shanara Gilbert Award by the Clinical Section of the Association of American Law Schools for her commitment to social justice on behalf of children and service to clinical legal education. And we're thrilled that she is here with us today. Dr. Jen Woolard um, is an associate professor of psychology at Georgetown University and the interim director of research at the Center for Social Justice. Her research focuses on adolescents and families in legal contexts, including police interrogation, culpability, the attorney-client relationship, and the role of parents in adolescents' legal decision making. She's published on the prevention of child abuse and youth violence prevention, and neglect policy regarding female delinquency and mental health needs of juvenile delinquents. She has presented her research findings to a wide variety of academic, legal, and policy audiences, and has won several awards for undergraduate teaching excellence. Um, she has, many of her publications can be accessed online, and she will be referring to them as well as um, research by other colleagues in this session. Those of you who want a more comprehensive um, lesson on adolescent development research should access the previous webinar that NACDL presented on this subject, which was led by jo Dr. <coughs> Wood. Thank you both for being here. All right, uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for inviting us to talk about this very important issue, interviewing and counseling the youth client. It is our hope that this session will be useful for attorneys representing young people both in the juvenile justice system and in the adult criminal justice system. So we, um, so just to set the stage, I should say that when I started practicing uh, quite some time ago, I started uh, out representing adults um, and then quickly began to specialize in representing juveniles uh, accused of delinquency. And when I made that transition, I realized how different and how difficult, to be quite honest with you, um, it was to interview and counsel young people. Um, it, was, it was quite a different experience than, than representing the adult clients um, that I had. Um, and I, I felt that difference across a variety of contexts, from the cell block interview, from trial preparation, helping my client make hard decisions about whether to take a plea or whether to testify, uh, disposition or sentencing planning, all of those different contexts um, were quite different in uh, working with young people than working with adults. So I, over time, had to really adjust and to develop a series of strategies for improving my attorney-client relationship and my counseling relationship. And um, so what we thought, uh, what uh, Dr. Willard and I thought we would do is to try to accomplish a few things in this session. So we set forth a few objectives. Um, by the end of the session, it is our hope that defenders, both juvenile and adult defenders, will be able to um, 
uh, identify some of the challenges associated with interviewing and counseling young people. Um, we also hope that the defenders will become familiar with the, the developmental features of adolescence that may impact the, the interview. So we definitely will be turning to Dr. Willard for, um, uh, to, to help us put some of these challenges in the lens or in the context of adolescent development. Um, we also hope um, to learn strategies that will help us as lawyers accommodate and enhance and overcome some of these developmental challenges that, have, that affect our, our interviewing and counseling. Um, in addition, we hope that we will leave this session understanding that the interviewing and counseling process is a fluid process that evolves um, considerably over the life of the case. So the way we work with our young people at the beginning of an interview um, or the beginning of a relationship will be different by the time we have concluded. We also hope um, that we will learn to interview our clients in adolescent appropriate language. Again, we will try out some ideas with you, um, talk to Dr. Willard about whether some of our language is appropriate for the young people that, we are, that we're working with. Um, we're also going to talk about using visual aids and the importance of visual aid with, uh, with, with young people. Um, a couple of more goals. We hope to uh, talk about ways we can establish a trusting relationship with our young people. Establishing trust is often a bit harder uh, with young people than with adults, and, and Dr. Willard will help us understand why that's so. And then finally, we hope to conclude with some useful resources for you um, that will aid in the client interview and the client counseling process. So um, I, we thought we would start with Dr. Willard. So mm -hmm. let me ask you, um, again, as a, as a juvenile defender, a number of challenges have, have um, appeared to me during the course of my uh, relationship with clients. Um, I feel like when I'm talking to clients, that to young clients, I'm speaking a different language, to be quite frankly, uh, to, to be quite frank with you. I also feel like uh, there are times when I'm not sure that my client really understands the questions that I've asked. I feel like uh, when I offer advice, um, that advice is received um, uh, with a level of authority. Um, uh, a higher level of authority than, than it might be the case when I'm working with or counseling an adult client. Um, and I, I noticed that my clients are concerned about right now. <laughs> they care about what's going to happen today, and it's hard to get them to look ahead to the future and be concerned about some of the long-term strategies and long-term concerns that I, as lawyer, have to, 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 to deal with. So I thought it would be great to sit here and have this conversation with you, <laughs> having you start off by telling us what some of the developmental issues are that impact this attorney-client relationship and the client counseling. Sure. That sounds great, Chris. Well, so many of the things that you described or that Chris described in terms of the challenges uh, that you were facing are really normal or normative parts of adolescence. So there's certainly a lot of variability among and between adolescents, but the developmental research that has occurred over the past several decades and more recently probably in the past decade that has focused specifically on legally relevant capacities for youth um, has uncovered or confirmed that there are some very basic developmental capacities that likely influence and affect the ways that attorneys uh, and youth interact. So what I want to do is uh, fairly briefly, hopefully, uh, talk through um, and describe a couple of those capacities, uh, both in terms of how youth are thinking um, and in terms of how youth are making decisions or how their emotions and other aspects are making decisions so that we can use that as the framework for then thinking about the specific kinds of strategies and advice that Chris is going to talk about in dealing with your client. So first, let's start with adolescent cognitive capacities. Now here, when I'm talking about cognitive capacities, I mean the capacities relevant to thinking and processing information. So compared to adults, <coughs> Uh, on average, adolescents have a few key differences uh, that are relevant for our discussion today. First of all, they process information and process questions differently. So I think we'll talk a little bit later on about the specifics of language and the way that uh, youth respond, but we can just lay on the table now as background that the way that youth understand and receive and respond to questions and think about them uh, is likely different from your average adult. And that difference, like all the differences I'm going to talk about, um, are 
is grounded in the fact that they're still developing. So it's a normal part of adolescence. As a part of that normal development, uh, they have limited or different communication skills, right? So uh, I don't know if a common response is, oh, <laughs> for some kids when you're interviewing them, but the fact that they have different or limited communication skills is going gonna, is gonna to suggest that you may need to use different or more pointed strategies in order to elicit information from them or to help them understand information that you're trying to convey to them. Um, their cognitive capacities more generally, uh, the ability to process information, to think about information, are really not fully developed until well into, I'd say, mid to late adolescence. So particularly for kids under age 15, in much of the research we see a bit of a break point in uh, around age 14 to 15 in terms of kids really fully developing some of those basic cognitive capacities uh, and uh, the ability to think or the capacity to think in ways that we think ab about adults thinking. All of this goes along with our uh, knowledge that youth uh, tend to have higher rates of learning disabilities and other mental health diagnoses in the justice system, right? So the youth that we see that become involved in the justice system, for example, in most of the studies, we see that they tend to have on an IQ that's on average one standard deviation below average, which means about 15 points below uh, a community sample's average. And we also know that there are much higher rates of mental health symptoms uh, and mental health diagnoses among kids that are involved in the justice system. So all of those things, uh, come together in thinking about how kids have the cognitive capacities to be able to respond in the attorney interview as you were talking, Chris. Setting aside cognitive capacities, now let me briefly talk about <coughs> psychosocial capacities. So these are essentially all the other things besides the formal thinking that are developing during the course of adolescence. We'll talk about the influence of emotion and social pressure and those kinds of things. Again, this is a fairly accelerated view of this, but I want to just give you an overview of some of the language so that we can talk about some of the specifics later as Chris is talking about uh, the aspects of interview and counseling that are uh, most important. So when we think about adolescent psychosocial capacities and what might be most relevant and how they differ from adults, uh, there are a couple of things that come to the fore. So adolescents tend not to think about the future as much as adults and not to think about it in the same way. So Chris, as you were mentioning before, that your clients seem to be thinking about now and have a harder time thinking about what long-term consequences might be. This is in part because of the aspects of the brain that are continuing to develop and the normal parts of adolescence that lead them to be more likely to focus on immediate consequences and rewards uh, rather than long-term consequences and potential negative outcomes that are going to happen in the future. Compared to adults, in thinking about this notion of risk and reward, they also, in that context, tend to focus more immediate rewards. Smaller, more immediate rewards are more enticing and more uh, interesting to youth, more compelling to youth, than rewards that are going to happen in the future that might even be bigger, right? So uh, in some of the very basic developmental studies, you know, we'll say, would you be interested in $5 today or $10 in a week? That would just be one example, right? youth are much more likely to take that immediate reward right now, even if it means they're going to have less benefit or less advantage than they would um, if they waited. Other ways, uh, consistent with but different from the notion of thinking about the future, adolescents also tend to be more impulsive than adults. And we talk about this in terms of their ability to control what they're going to do as opposed to jumping right forward into it. Okay, so that's slightly different than thinking about the future. They tend to be more impulsive than adults. They tend to engage in more risk-taking behavior than adults. And again, this is all an, a normative part of adolescence. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't important consequences which may bring uh, some of our youth into contact with the justice system. But on average, youth tend to be more impulsive and they tend to take more risks and to look more favorably on taking risks. Um, again, 
developmentally appropriate, right? Risk taking is one of the things that help get, helps get adolescents out into the world, right? And moves them into uh, young adulthood and thinking about moving from the home out into the larger community. Of course, the key is to do that in ways that don't imperil their short-term or long-term development or prospects. And then youth, finally, are generally more susceptible to peer influences than adults. So consistent with what we might think about as the stereotype of adolescents, they do pay attention more to their peers uh, and what their peers think or what they think their peers thinking uh, can be more important to them as they make decisions or think about consequences and so forth. All right, I want to talk briefly about stress and influences on adolescent decision making. Now, adults um, are vulnerable to stress uh, and the, um, the challenges that stressful circumstances provide, just as adolescents are. But compared to adults, adolescents are more vulnerable to the effects of stress. So they're more likely to engage in poor decision making under stress than adults are. So they're more vulnerable to making those bad decisions. They're more impaired under stress. So they function even less effectively, less to their full capacity than adults might under those uh, same circumstances. One thing I want to add there, let me go back, is um, it can be important to think about the difference between what we describe in the science world as hot and cold cognition. So you can think of hot cognition as your ability to think and make decisions under really stressful immediate circumstances and cold cognition as making decisions under calm, uh, plenty of time and reasonable circumstances. Kids are more susceptible to being worse at making decisions under those hot cognition circumstances. And then we'll talk briefly about the notion of suggestibility, right? So their likelihood of being influenced. Um, research suggests that younger adolescents, and here I mean, again, adolescents probably under the age of 14, might be more suggestible than older youth, so responsive to both their peers and to adults. They might be more likely to conform to adult expectations. So if someone in authority says, this is what you should do, or these are the options, they may be more likely to conform uh, to those, uh, what they believe are the expectations of the adults. Now, older adolescents might do the opposite and might be more likely to say, I'm not going to do what you want to do, uh, as a function of being that stereotypical rebellious adolescent. So it can go either way, but particularly for the younger kids, uh, they're more likely um, to be suggestible and susceptible to those peer influences uh, than those um, older adolescents and young adults are. One of the stereotypes, I think, both in practice and as we went into the research field, was the idea that um, knowledge and experience might uh, put adolescents on a par with adults. So, for example, that kids who have experience in the justice system might then know more about it um, and be able to engage in decision-making like adults. And generally, we find that that's not the case. So in studies, for example, that the MacArthur Network on Adolescent Development and Juvenile Justice engaged in looking at capacities of youth uh, to be competent to stand trial or um, capacities relevant to culpability, we find that adolescents compared to adults are not able to identify as many consequences for actions as adults are both in terms of short-term and long-range. So long-term consequences, right, sequencing events, if this, then this, and then that might happen, is much more of a challenge for youth than it is for uh, adults. We also find that they weigh options differently. So what adults might see as a risk not worth taking, adolescents might see as a quite reasonable risk. Uh, and so uh, when we present the same options to youth and adults, youth tend to use a different calculation, if you will, in their head about what to do. Um, they also may not know what's in, what information is important to convey to the attorney in a case, right? So. Um, as you are, as Chris will talk about, and when you're trying to elicit information from your client, it may be that what seems obvious to adults about what would be important to know um, just might not be the case for kids. They might not be able to make that distinction. 
All right. Uh, in terms of identity and social development, so this is the job, right? The job of adolescence is to become a person, in a sense, as they're growing during this time. So that means that their identity, how they think of themselves and how they describe themselves, right, as they come down the stairs each morning, they may be trying on a totally different persona. You know, we can think about stereotypes in terms of geek or jock or any of those kinds of things, but that kids may be trying on those identities in an attempt to understand who they really are and who they want to be. So that's an appropriate and important job for kids <coughs> at that age. They're also developing their own autonomy, right? Uh, and some resistance to authority figures, like I was mentioning before. So as adolescents get older, they may no longer just simply go along with what authority figures want and instead do the opposite, which is in an unthinking way, simply do the opposite of what authority figures want for the sake of doing the opposite or doing different things. Um, and then adolescents are also exquisitely sensitive to fairness. Uh, and so their perceptions of fairness can, in some cases, overwhelm other issues that may be at hand when they think they or others are being treated unfairly. Uh, a couple more things about uh, identity and social development. I mentioned peer influence and peer pressure. Well, that translates into a self-consciousness, uh, perhaps an overemphasis in thinking that they're being watched by others and being judged by others. Uh, so they may be uh, taking offense at what <coughs> seem to be innocuous comments about their dress or the way that they talk or the way that they act. Um, they may be loyal to family and friends and get angry when something negative is said about them, even something in an offhanded or an unintentional uh, way. Um, and they may be thinking about how their attorney is going to react to information that they disclose. And so they might be reluctant to disclose information if they think that they're going to be viewed negatively by counsel. Similarly, in the reluctance to provide information and thinking how they're going to be judged, they might be um, reluctant because of that salience of peers to provide information about friends or other folks who were involved in the uh, alleged incident or the alleged conduct. I mentioned briefly before the, the notion that, um, or the fact that adolescents in the justice system have higher rates of learning disabilities and mental health issues than youth that are not involved in the justice system. Um, there are a variety of studies that have looked at this, so there's a range that can run upwards of 50 to 75 percent of youth that are involved in the justice system may have significant mental health needs or mental health diagnoses compared to community populations. Um, you'll see on the screen some of the most common mental health disorders in this population. Um, again, many of these may not be news to folks, but it's certainly in terms of substance abuse, oppositional and conduct disorder, which to some degree defines the kids as they come involved with the justice system and those reactions that I was talking about, but as well as intellectual disabilities and other kinds of depressive disorders. Um, this can further complicate the relationship that you have with your client, and mental health symptomology, symptomatology may not always be obvious uh, as you're working with your client, so something to know and to be aware of. Um, and so that, perhaps not so quickly, <laughs> but it's a bit of an overview of some of the different factors and the baseline of developmental uh, research that potentially could be relevant as we talk about these um, kinds of things. So speaking of these issues of representation, um, Chris, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, talk a little bit about the strategies that you use with this developmental work in the background. How do you respond to and interact with your clients? Yeah, no, this is a, a thank you, uh, Jen. I think it's been very, very helpful for me to understand what I've been seeing <laughs> from yeah. a developmental lens, because I think everything you said rings true with me. So um, over the years, I really have begun to develop a series of strategies to to, to, to improve my relationship with my clients. Um, so let me just share some of those with you. Um, from the very beginning, one of the things that I think is even more important in working with young people than working with adult clients is to gather background information about your client. Um, and, and so what do I mean about that? Um, I mean by that, I'm talking about school records, mental health records, 
um, medical records, interviewing collateral contacts, uh, contacts such as family members, counselors, um, uh, all the people who are important in your clients' lives to get a, a better understanding of what's important to your clients, um, what your clients' strengths are so that you can draw upon them, what are their worries so that you can be attentive to those concerns early on, uh, dealing with, as Jen says, the immediacy um, of our clients' concerns, um, accessing our clients' uh, Medicaid and insurance files, things of that nature are even more important with, with juvenile clients. I do um, want to make one caveat, which is that we do have to be careful um, about gathering uh, so much information from our clients before the first interview. So a couple of things. One, as we all know, in the detention interview or the cell block interview, the very first time we meet our clients, we're not going to have time to gather all of this uh, information. Um, so that's one caveat. The second caveat is even when we do have that kind of time, we need to make sure we get our client's permission. Um, the importance of client loyalty, um, you know, uh, Dr. Willard talked about fairness fanatics. That's exactly right. They want to know that we're on their side even more than an adult client. So I want to get information about my client because I think it's going to be useful and it's going to aid and improve the relationship, but I also want to preview that with my client and explain to my client why, and we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, so when I'm talking to collateral contacts, again, families, teachers, um, and the like, there, there are a series of questions that I want to know from them. One, what's my client's level of cognitive uh, capacity? What's his level of cognitive uh, ability? How is he um, with language? Um, how do I need to frame my questions? And I'm, I've been amazed at how um, I can change the nature of my interview by looking at school records first. Um, other things, uh, learning disabilities, speech impediments, um, are there uh, mental health issues that have been diagnosed and documented? Is my child suffering from trauma? I might want to be careful about how and where I conduct an interview room. Um, some of our interview rooms are pretty small and might be traumatizing for a young person. So I need to think about where I want to have that interview. Um, I, when, when I'm thinking about loyalty and not offending my client, I want to think about who his peers are and how important family members are. So if there are issues with the family dynamic um, in terms of parental drug use and the like, I might be careful about how I address that issue if I know how important my client's mother is or my client's parents are um, to, that particular, uh, to that particular child. I want to think about and ask about uh, my client's self-esteem, some of that I'll be able to assess as I work with the client, but it's good to know um, as much of that information as I can. Again, I mentioned this strengths. Uh, what are my client's strengths? What can I, uh, what is my client really good at? Can I um, uh, talk about my client's art, a capacity for art um, and music um, as a segue, as a rapport build um, with my client? And some of these uh, certainly apply to your adult clients, but uh, we find that they're particularly useful in young, when working with young people. Um, uh, another thing um, that I have found to be particularly interesting is figuring out when my clients process best. Are they morning people, or are they afternoon people, or are they evening people? And I've got to adjust um, in working with young people. I need to schedule my interviews accordingly um, uh, uh, based on that. I've found that many of my young teenage clients aren't so great in the morning. <laughs> and I tend to be a morning person, and I tend to want to <laughs> have that client interview in the morning, and I've had to adjust. I'm curious about whether there's any research on teenagers and the, and the clock. <laughs> right, and the clock, right. Well, there is. Um, not specifically on this topic, right, but we do know that it's not just stereotype or laziness that leads teenagers to not be able to get up in the morning, yeah. that their sleep clock or their waking clock actually does shift during adolescence and shifts later in the morning. So they are just able to stay up later more, and that's more natural, and it's harder for them to get up early for an early interview. So adjusting <laughs> right. um, is the key here. Right. Um, and then the final thing that I've also noticed um, it, it, as, re, as it relates to cognitive capacity of my clients is that I can discern a lot by listening to, uh, to listening to my client and watching how they're reacting to my sentence structure. Um, I can uh, learn a lot from uh, uh, mimicking their own sentence structure, things of that nature. So paying attention to their speech patterns, their language, and being able to, to, to respond appropriately um, has taught me a lot. 
So, um, Jen, you talked a lot about, um, or, or, or you talked some about trust, or we talked about trust, right. young people building trust with, with adults. And so I've really been thinking over the years about what are some strategies that I can uh, put in place uh, to build trust with my young people um, or my young clients that I work with. And I, I've got to say that time, investment of time is the single most important variable in improving the trust relationship. Again, the, the interviewing and counseling uh, relationship evolves over time. The more time you spend on individual client meetings as well as over the life of the case increases the, their capacity to trust you. So some of my early interviews with my client, um, my client might not say much, <laughs> but over time they will begin to open up to me um, uh, and, and, and the like. The other thing that helps with trust is starting individual interviews with non-threatening questions. Right? So what can we, we talk about? So we've already mm -hmm. talked about some of our clients' strengths and some of our clients' likes. Might I start the, the conversation there and then work my way um, into some of the harder stuff? Um, let the client lead, a young client lead a little bit more um, in, a, in a juvenile interview than in an adult interview. So foregoing the attorney's uh, uh, agenda is even more important in this context, um, focusing on what's important for the youth at the beginning. Um, find out what the, what the young person is worried about in the cell block interview. Have they eaten? Um, are they tired? Are they afraid of what their mother is going to think? Um, are they embarrassed to have to go out in court? Are they embarrassed by being seen by other people? We need to start managing some of those emotions right at the beginning of the interview. Um, finding common areas of commonality without being disingenuous. So if the kid likes sports and likes basketball, can we talk about some of that um, to, to, to bridge the gap? Um, and, didn't, and demonstrating genuine concern um, for the child all goes a long way to building trust with, with young people. Um, <clears throat> I think another area is really explaining why we ask certain questions has really, I think, been one of the things that has been most helpful. Um, and, and so what do I mean by that? So at, a, at our initial client interview, we're often interviewing our child in order to make arguments for release at the detention hearing. And we start off introducing our client um, you know, to who we are and then immediately start asking all these personal questions about them. Um, what do you do during the day? Do you go to school? You know, how do you get along with your mother? All kinds of things that are uh, threatening potentially threatening to the child, um, they're embarrassed about, um, they're eager to cover. So, but if we explain, if we lay a foundation, if we take that extra time, I'm going to ask you some questions that might be uncomfortable, that might be awkward, um, that might be unusual, but here's why. And tie it to what um, Dr. Willard talks about. She talks about the immediate concerns. They're worried about right now and they can't anticipate down the road, but if you can tie your questions and your explanation to, for your questions to what's going to happen next. So I'm going to go into court next and I'm going to argue to the judge that you be released. So I need to ask you these questions in order to have the best arguments. I find that my kids open up a lot more. Sure. Um, so, okay. Um, another area um, that, that helps, or another idea that helps with building trust is this idea of really listening without judgment. Listening and inquiring without judgment. And I think we as adults ask questions that are loaded without even realizing it. Okay? Either um, our questions are in fact loaded or they're perceived as being loaded or perceived as being judgmental. So I think now a lot more um, carefully about the order of my questions, right? So I might not start with the offense related questions. I might not start with the what the child is doing wrong kind of questions. Um, also, I. Um, We'll talk about, uh, again, talk about what the, what the child has done well as a starting point. But I also will start the, the conversation by reassuring my young client that my representation is not contingent upon what the youth tells me, right? I'm here for you. I'm on your side, regardless of what you tell me. And here are the reasons why I need this information. 
okay? Um, and then the, the, the key, the real key takeaway here is the judgmental language. And this is where I have to be super careful about how I frame questions. So in preparation for the session, Dr. Willard and I were talking about ways in which we might frame some questions that we ask as a, as a standard part of interviewing children. So in a juvenile court, curfew matters, right? So um, I might have heard from a probation officer that my child was out at 10 o'clock or that the offense, the arrest occurred at 10 o'clock at night, well after the child's curfew. So I don't want to start the question with, so why were you out after curfew? Sounds pretty innocuous to us. Right. Um, but a child is perceiving it as, as why questions in particular as threatening. As, as, um, as, as, as they have committed some wrong or some judgment. So what might be a more neutral way to ask the question? Um, might I just ask, um, what did you do last night? What time did you get home last night? Um, really just changing the why to a what. Um, also, too, if I, if I need to find out information that the client is reluctant to give, I might switch the, 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 the source of information. I might say to the client, so will your mom say that you came, out of, came in after curfew? Will your mom say um, uh, that, that, that you were late last night? Those kinds of questions. Um, other examples are we often are asking our clients about school attendance. Um, so instead of saying, you know, why haven't you been going to school lately? I might say, you know, so, so describe your day to me. Tell me what your typical day is like. Um, um, I might ask, how do you like school? As a bridge into the school category and get them to start talking about school so they don't like school. So tell me, why don't you like school? And let's work our way in. And that gets you to the same place instead of asking, why didn't you go to school? Or why is everybody saying you don't go to school? Why is there a truancy problem? We just flip the script and ask a more open-ended dialogue. And you know, Chris, um, in research, sometimes we have to ask really difficult questions too, right? And, and have this issue of social desirability, right? We might be asking for information that doesn't reflect on, your, on the youth in a positive light. So some of the ways that we framed questions, as you were saying, rather than saying, why didn't you go to school? Or why are you truant? Some of the ways that we frame questions are things like, you know, some kids have some trouble getting to school, right? Mm -hmm. Or something mm -hmm. like that. So mm -hmm. to make it more broad and make it uh, more acceptable, not in a lying way, right? But, but saying that it's true, that they're not the only one that might be facing some of these challenges. So that might be a way also to frame some of the things that you were talking about to elicit more information. Great, that's very helpful. Um, so other thoughts that I've had on this, this, this issue of trust are just some, some simple tips that you might want to be mindful of. One is having, is, is, is this idea that two adults should rarely interview a youth together. Of course there are no finite rules, right? We have many attorney social worker relationships, uh, many, um, in my context, attorney student relationships, things of that nature. But as a general matter, where it can be avoided, two adults should interview a child together. It is often perceived to be uh, intimidating for the child. Um, also, here's another one that, that may be pretty obvious and that we should all be doing when we represent adult clients as well as juvenile clients, and that is using physical cues um, to show that you're listening. But I have been so amazed by young people <laughs> and how observant they are. And so when I talk about physical cues, I'm talking about nodding in agreement, making encouraging comments, avoid abrupt changes in, um, uh, in, in topic. And I think this one is really important. We have an agenda, <laughs> particularly, let's say, in some of these early interviews. We've got a limited amount of time we wanna, uh, uh, that we have allotted to interview our young people, and we need to get through our to-do list. Right. Um, and so we often jump from topic to topic to topic. And the child often perceives something wholly unintended um, from that. They also they need closure. So wrap up your questions, wrap up your answer, wrap up their answers before moving on to the next topic. Um, using a, a, a combination of eye contact and note taking is particularly important. One of the most amazing stories that I that I uh, remember from my early days of representing young people, I was taking notes, you know, fairly copiously apparently, um, uh, in a client interview, and then all of a sudden he must have said something, and I stopped taking notes, and literally the kid goes, "Aren't you going to write that down?" And I was like, "Wow, <laughs> they are really paying attention um, in a way that I've just really not had an adult client uh, do. They let us, <laughs> the adult clients let us do what we need to do, um, but the kids are." They're 
they're taking cues. Um, also, we, we need to learn to, to validate our young people without necessarily condoning their behavior, but validating. So I hear what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, again, these are great tips for interviewing adult clients as well, but um, really important and useful for young folks. Another one is body language, being aware of our body language. You know, a, a child looking at me with my arms folded is perceived quite differently <laughs> um, uh, by a young person maybe than an, than an adult. So being aware of that. Um, and then a couple of final tips on the trust factor. I, instead of saying to my clients, you can trust me, I back away from that. And I just spend more time explaining the attorney-client relationship. I spend more time explaining the role of defense counsel. We're actually going to talk about this. Um, uh, we're going to circle back to this because we think there's some interesting tips we might offer up uh, about how to introduce yourself as a defense attorney to a young person. Um, but it, it requires more time. That's the takeaway here. The other uh, rule of the house uh, that I have, have, have certainly adopted for my practice is never make a promise that you can't keep. Keep every promise that you make. And my favorite addition is and add a few, make a few promises, a few easy promises, so that you get an opportunity to show your client that you will keep your promises. Um, one of the things that I've also found to be quite interesting with young people is everything is perceived as a promise, <laughs> even when I didn't mean it to be. So I'll be in the cell block with a young person. He'll say, when is my case being called? Um, well, we should be next. Oh, that's a promise. <laughs> so you've got to be careful about even how you frame something. Um, if you say to your client, I'm going to come see you at the jail later on tonight, you better make a way um, to come see your client because it's automatically perceived. We go out to the jails and to the, uh, to the juvenile de detention facilities, and they say, my mommy promised that they were coming and she didn't come. My lawyer promised that they were coming and they didn't come. And it really, it just, it means so much to them. So just, just keeping promises uh, becomes even more important with young people. Um, on this question about the cognitive limitations, circling back to that, some other tips on that should be true for adult clients, but even more for juveniles. One is avoiding legalese. Um, language that you and I perceive as common everyday language, first of all, as lawyers, <laughs> um, is, is not commonplace for a young person. Things as simple as um, pleading guilty, um, uh, uh, sentencing, just basic words are not common place for young people despite as, as, as Jen said despite the stereotypes that kids who you know know the system and are savvy um, aren't quite as savvy as they let on or not quite savvy um, period because lack of information the other thing is avoiding long questions um, really asking uh, uh, short concise questions and allowing the young person to answer is really important. Um, not packing a lot of information, not packing a lot of options into one question is important. Also using uh, visual aids, and I, I'll come back to this <coughs> again so that we can have a couple of examples. I, I'm a real fan. Um, my students <laughs> at Georgetown always sort of laugh at me. They're like, oh, you and your charts. <laughs> but I find charts are really useful. Um, and helping, having my clients help me build those charts. And so what kind of charts and, and visual aids am I talking about? So if I'm counseling a young person about whether to take a plea or not take a plea, I might have a simple two-column chart the benefits um, or the pros of, of taking a plea and the pros of going to trial in column two. And I don't fill it out. Um, before I go to that session, I'll have the, the, the young person work through with me. So why might we take this plea? Oh, because I can get out. And they kind of get engaged in, in, in the process. So why might I go to trial? Because we might win. You know? And they really, a, a lot of my young people, both you know, the younger adolescents and the older adolescents, really get engaged and they begin, to, <clears throat> excuse me, they begin to own the decision for themselves. Um, and they become empowered to make decisions by using this, this kind of charts. But I will show you one um, uh, before we finish. Um, I, I think about also about finding analogies that might be useful. And I must admit, 
um, I'm not great at this, <laughs> finding analogies that a child um, will understand. Um, but to the extent those of you who are good at it, um, whether it be a basketball analogy or, you know, or something else, um, I, I've, I have seen analogies work well um, with young people. Um, we, um, this is also something definitely that Dr. Willard talked about, but abstract thinking, hypothetical thinking is very difficult for young people. And so I avoid the what if. And I might ask a, an adult client, you know, well, what if the witness uh, doesn't show up? What if your defense witness doesn't come? And I try to stay away from those kinds of questions with young people and, and, and focus on what's con concrete. Um, and then the sort of final example or idea in this area is thinking about um, or allowing your, your client to explain back concepts. Um, and I think that's got to be done delicately. I think it can be seen as condescending. <laughs> so tell me what I just told you. You know, we're not in school. We're an attorney-client relationships. But there are ways um, that you can, you can uh, engage the client and have the client repeat back concepts. For example, in these visual aids. Maybe we talk about it orally first. And then as we begin to write the chart, we have the client, we have the young person tell us back what some of the benefits of, of a trial would be um, back, onto, um, back onto the chart. So that might help. All right? Um, of course, we always want to ask clarifying questions. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I sometimes feel like I'm speaking a different language from my client. I will not regale you with hilarious stories of <laughs> uh, my misunderstandings very early on in my relationship with my young people with slang when I moved into the District of Columbia. Um, but uh, if there are terms that you don't understand, always asking the client to explain those terms. Um, and they'll see you as genuine, right? Um, all right. And the final thing uh, on this, I probably said final a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, is, is rehearsing. Uh, courtroom colloquies with our young clients is way more important. I don't recall a time, I'm sure I have done this, but I don't recall a time where I have had a young person uh, moot or rehearse a plea colloquy back and forth, um, an adult client. I, I, um, but I have done it many, many times with young people. So, all right, let's pretend like we're in court. Sit up straight, <laughs> you know, and, and I will literally rehearse what I think the judge will ask that young person and have them say the words to me. I also um, sometimes, so notwithstanding the fact that I don't do a lot of rehearsals with adult clients in the in the in the plea context, I certainly also rehearse with our, our clients' mothers and and, yes. and and parents a lot before we go into, just to make sure we're all on the same page. All right. Um, other tips um, around this question of how do we improve our clients' ability to give us information? Our, how do we improve our young person's ability to recall and remember details? How do we help them understand what's important? Well, I am a huge fan of the T-funnel method of client interviewing. Um, and all the credit goes to uh, uh, Binder and Price, um, who have written a, a, a wonderful, comprehensive client inter interviewing textbook, which we will provide you with a citation to at the end of the interview. But let's talk about the, the T-funnel method. Um, uh, and so basically the T-funnel method is just like it sounds. It is asking open-ended questions to start an interview and then drilling down to the specifics by following up with narrow interviews, okay? So the basic T-funnel method, open-ended questions first, followed up by narrow questions. Really important with child clients. Um, so um, other tips related to that are avoiding questions that call for a yes or a no, okay, shrug kind of answers, right? So asking them to describe, asking them, you know, what, not what if, but what happened or um, how. Those kinds of questions are really important. Journalistic types of questions, okay, are, are really useful. All right. Um, other tips in this area. All right, we already covered that. The who, what, where. Notice I left off the why this time with young people. Also, another really important point is to allow time for silence. Okay? So kids sometimes sit and think 
they assess whether or not it's okay to give the right answer or not even the right answer, but to, it's okay to answer a certain way or not. Um, so really allowing time for silence becomes uh, particularly important. Um, and another tip that I've really found useful with clients is developing chronologies. So sometimes I will go further back with a juvenile client than I might with an adult client. So sometimes with an adult client, I can zero in on that moment that's important. But with a juvenile client, I might step step back. So tell me, just, just stop for a second. Tell me what, it, what time you got up. What did you do when you got up? And I might work the client through the day to get me to the place that we need to be. Um, so again, developing chronologies through the whole day is really important. Um, the other uh, tip, related to this notion of, particularly with the younger clients, being more suggestible that, that Dr. Wooler talked about, is avoiding suggesting answers um, to our young clients. So avoiding even the subtle clues about what um, should have happened, about what might have happened. Sometimes, and I think this it's really interesting, it's a delicate balance. I mean, Dr. Wooler talked about sometimes to make a client feel okay, right? To, you might empathize by saying other people have experienced X, Y, or Z. That, I think, makes a lot of sense to me. But sometimes we go, we go uh, further than we need to, right? So it's avoiding subtle clues about, about what, what they did. They fill in the gaps by what adults suggest to them. So when is it okay to ask a, a, a young person um, uh, some leading questions? Well, first of all, let's talk about when to avoid leading questions. Avoid leading questions so that they don't fill in answers and so that they don't give you the answers that you expect. You um, can do leading questions, however, to show empathy for the client and to get the client to, 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 to not be ashamed to give you an answer. Um, all right. Also, this ties to not only are the young people observing our body language, but I have really had to uh, adjust and, and recognize that I can't misread a young person's body language, right? So, um, and I, I find that not only do we as defense attorneys do this, but probation officers do this, judges do this, they misread a child's body language, which might be, um, uh, it, 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 let's put it this way, the body language may be misread as anger, defiance of authority, rebellion, hostility, lack of cooperation, when in reality it's a function of some other adolescent normative right. kind of, of, of reaction. Um, anything from, uh, uh, lack of trust of adults. It could be caused by um, fatigue. It can be caused by depression. It could be caused by fear of others in the cell block. Um, any number of, of, of reasons, differences between you um, as lawyer uh, and the client, meaning differences in race, class, and the like. So this body language that, that we're perceiving um, may not be about anger and rebellion hostility. Um, it really might be, it, it might be something completely and wholly different. Um, um, again, once we've identified some of these root causes for that behavior, asking our clients, are you okay? You know, um, sometimes I might say to the client, you know, you look sad. I'm worried about you. Are you okay? And then see if they'll open up to you. And then again, demonstrating genuine empathy for the root causes um, of, of some of this behavior. And the key thing is that I always uh, tell young lawyers that I'm training is don't take any of it personally and don't mirror the reaction. So if a kid acts out in anger, I don't give anger back, right? A kid acts out in refusing to talk, I'm not going to throw up my hands and say, forget it then, if you're not going to talk to me, I'm gone. Um, and of course, we wouldn't hope to do that in adult clients either, but you know, young people can push your buttons as much as we love them. <laughs> um, so we really have to make sure that we don't react in kind to their behavior. Um, other tips is, I, I've, I always find interesting is, to what extent can I reduce stress? You talked about mm -hmm. how young people react in stressful circumstances. How can I create that controlled, cold environment for the child? Um, and cold, by that we simply mean in the, right. in the psychological sense, right. the cognitively cold. Time, right? Time, we've already talked about being the number one factor. But what kind of physical space can help reduce the stress? Um, 
one of the things, uh, and what are some of the other tactics? One is is uh, explaining next steps. My clients, I don't care what kind of bravado they put on, often have no idea what's going to be next and how long <laughs> it's going to take. So um, those simple questions like when am I going to get to go before the judge are often much more loaded than that. It's when am I going to go before the judge? What is the judge going to say? Is the judge going to let me out? Those kinds of things. So to the extent that I could talk my client through the next steps, I can alleviate some of the stress and get him or her to focus on the conversation that we need to have in that interview. Um, also, uh, trying to create a comfortable, safe environment for the interview. Um, so it, it's, it's uh, I have, the, have some luxury of, of resources in the sense that I work at a university and I run a clinical program. I run my practice out of a university. So I have some of the luxury of being able to get in my car and drive to visit my clients at their homes. I rarely do an interview at the office, and that is a point of personal choice. And the reason is I can pick a safe, comfortable space for them. So I might go to my client's home only to discover that it's actually chaotic, either chaotic for the moment or chaotic for that kid emotionally. So I can make a choice in that moment to say to the child and say to the child's parents, can I take them down the street? to McDonald's. Um, so people sometimes say, you really take your kids to McDonald's. If I can find a quiet McDonald's with a corner in which I can have a private attorney-client relationship, I sure do. Um, I, I will on a nice day, let's go out to the park. Let's go somewhere. Um, now, if I'm going to do those things, I, I want to situate my client in a way that he's not distracted. So I might have my client's back facing the playground, right? Or I might have my client's back facing the door to the McDonald's so he's not watching people come in and out, those kinds of things. So I want to reduce the number of distractions, but I create a safe space. They can breathe. They can get some food and they can eat, um, that kind of thing, while we're talking. And I find it to be extremely um, effective. Um, I've already talked about avoiding distractions. Um, there are times, and we'll talk about uh, briefly at least, um, the custodial interview, the cell block interview. There are times when we can't control the absolute physical space, right? I can't <laughs> take my client out um, of the cell block. However, um, I can uh, try to explain or help alleviate the child's uh, anxieties. I'll acknowledge them. I'll say to the child, like, you know, how do you feel back here? How are you back here? What's it like back here? To get them to know or help them understand it's okay to me to, for you to talk about how you're feeling and let me, let's work through that first and then start the, the, the interview. Um, also when they're at the detention facility, I make sure that I talk to the staff in advance about getting a, a quiet space and a private space, not just for the attorney client privilege, but also because they're more comfortable and they're more likely to open up to me if they don't if they're not afraid that a guard is going to come walking through or that some other kid who they have to act brave for is going to come through if they need to cry I want them to be in a space where they can cry so um, I think trying to do what we can even in those custodial settings um, is really important so it's just worth a couple of quick minutes to, to talk about the custodial interview, the cell block interview, it's one of the most difficult interviews, I think, for young people. Um, we all know we've been in different jails. Some jurisdictions have plexiglass. My jurisdiction has plexiglass. So when I'm talking to my client for the very first time, I can't even pass him a note. I can't even pass my business card because he is on the other side of the glass. So um, I, you know, I apologize that right off the beginning. And I'm like, you know, the next time you see me, I promise you, I'm not going to be, and that's a promise I can keep, because <laughs> they're going to come out to the courthouse, courtroom eventually, but the next time I see you, it's not going to be behind this glass, and so I apologize, um, you know, for that. Um, I also tell my client right up off, off the start in an interview like that, that I have very little time. Um, and that I, you know, again, I promise you, I will give you more time um, soon. Um, for this uh, for this attorney client interview, but right now let's have a short one. Um, we all know that um, uh, that the cell blocks are often crowded in my jurisdiction. The kids aren't at least at the initial cell block interview. They're in there with other kids, mm -hmm. and so that changes that dynamic radically. Um, radically, my kid puts on a very different demeanor often in that cell block interview than the kid that than he does when I interview him later. So I'm very mindful of that um, with the young people. So, so we know um, how tired and hungry they are in that cell block interview. So, um, and that's just on top of all the other things that we've talked about. Right. They're meeting me, a new adult for the first time. They don't trust me, those kinds of things. So 
And I was just going to say, also at that point, Chris, they probably met lots of adults, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. So the, it, situating, as you were talking about describing who you are, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but they may just have met lots of people in order yeah. to get processed into the detention center or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, so absolutely. You, you may be one in a long line of folks. Exactly. And that ties us to what one of the things we're going to do in a few minutes is talk about how you interview, uh, how do you introduce yourself as the defender to a young person is really quite different. I find that a number of my adult clients, they know that I'm different than everybody who's just preceded me. Mm -hmm. um, young people have no idea <laughs> that, you know, a probation officer, right. you know, uh, uh, you know, someone else who's coming to take the urine sample, excuse me, <laughs> you know, whoever, all these people, these parade of people, the police officers, that I'm not a part of that system. And so I have to distinguish myself from, from that. Um, so what do I do in, a, in a, the, my custodial cell block interview? I have four primary goals um, in that interview with the young person. One is introducing myself right explaining my role as a defender and establishing rapport is the very first thing all in one or you know it's a part of the same set and for youth i cannot say this enough spending extra time on that introduction is really critical um the second goal second of my four goals is explaining what's going to happen next right at the initial hearing at the initial detention hearing puts it in context for the child explains why we're going to ask the questions that we're asking third goal um, that I might have for this interview would be, um, sorry about that, these come up slow sometimes, um, getting information for the release argument, right? So I'm going to tell my client I need to get this information from you for the release argument and I begin to ask those questions. And then the final thing is to spend a little bit of time on the facts. And one of the things that I think is true for adults and, and juveniles, but particularly for my young people, they want to talk about how that police officer mistreated them. Right in that cell block interview they want to talk about the facts and how they're innocent and how you know um you know what's going to happen in this case and it's really hard in that very short time limited cell block interview to to try to get the kid to say to you or, or to, to to move with you into a conversation about release arguments so i really work hard to be empathetic and promise to come back and talk more about the facts more about that police officer and how he treated you but right now I really want to try to get you home or at least try to get information from you so I can argue to the judge that you go home so I have to spend a little bit more time um, getting our kid to move on so again we have to forego our agenda as as an as attorneys but yet at the same time in a cell block interview that that really sort of small time window interview you do have to move some some uh, move the client to some degree into the to your goal and to your agenda all right so let's uh, I thought it'd be great to just talk for a second about how do we explain our role um, as defenders and I, I think this is really hard <laughs> um, so and I'd love your your insight as we go about whether these work or don't work one of the things that we might do and I think there are a number of strategies that work well for young people but with time permitting, I might ask that client the open-ended question. So, um, do you know what a lawyer is, right? I am your lawyer. Have you ever had a lawyer before? Um, do you know anyone who's ever had a lawyer before? And, you know, what, and, and tell me a little bit about what that lawyer um, was like. You learn a lot <laughs> from the answers to those questions, okay? Um, I mean, the answers might signal to you, among other things, that uh, they've had prior bad relationships with lawyers, that family members have had prior bad relationships with lawyers. Um, you might learn that, that they have this perception that adults never listen to them, and adults and lawyers are one and the same. Right. So just by listening to that answers, you, you know, you know what some of their concerns and what some of their worries are. Um, so that's that's one strategy. Um, I don't know uh, uh, what some of the I, I, my understanding actually from Dr. Willard, and I, uh, I'd be curious to what to what you've learned is that there's been some research on children's misunderstandings about the role of lawyers and who lawyers are. Right. There have been some research studies that have specifically looked at that. And what's been interesting to me is even the assumptions that we made as researchers about mm. what the misunderstandings might be were too advanced, <laughs> or even more basic. So what I'm going to show you next is a slide that um, was generated from an interview study we did here in the Washington, D.C. area where we brought 
a child and their parent into our lab for an interview about what they interviewed separately. What did they understand, right, about concepts for the law? So these were not kids that were currently engaged in the system, mm. but a significant chunk of them had been engaged in the system in the past, right? But we were just want to understand what do teenagers and their parents know about the system and how it works? And one of the things that we asked them as a multiple choice question was, what's the difference between a lawyer and an attorney? Okay, and there were a couple of answers that we gave them. I'm going to show you that they could choose from. Let me show you next what they did. So let me orient you, right? We had 11 to 13 year olds, 14 to 15 year olds, uh, 16 to 17 year olds, and then their parent, okay? And here are the options that they had. Uh, does it mean that the judge appoints an attorney and you hire a lawyer? Is an attorney the prosecutor and a lawyer the defense? Or are they the same thing, right? Which of course, nothing. They're the same thing is the correct answer. But look at the percentage, particularly of kids, right, that thought that there was some difference between attorney and lawyer. The vast majority of parents, 90%, no difference, right, same thing. So even something so basic as how you introduce yourself as attorney or lawyer or how you're referring to the prosecutor, right, you may and as Chris was saying, doing this in a non-patronizing way, <laughs> right? But you say, you know, you may hear me referred to as an attorney, it might be a lawyer, you know, all that's the same thing. I'm the defense attorney here to represent you, right? To go into that kind of um, explanation. So really with kids wanting to be really careful about some of the very basic language that we use. So not just something like a colloquy, right? Or yeah. a plea agreement, but even who you are in terms of what does it mean to use the word lawyer versus the word attorney. So that's just one example. Great. So um, in addition to asking maybe the, that, that question, you know, right. to get some insight from your client about you know, what, what do they think a lawyer is and what a lawyer is supposed to do, um, I've also spent some time thinking about um, how do I present it to my client? How do I describe it to my client? And I must say that I don't think I, you know, have a perfect 100% solution for how to make this introduction. It is organic. It's a conversation with the child. But here's an example of something that I might uh, say to the child in explaining the attorney-client privilege. So I might say to my client, you know, anything you say will stay between you and me, just between the two of us, unless you tell me that it's okay for me to tell somebody else. So even the judge, I just told you I'm going to go into the courtroom and I'm going to talk to the judge, but you get to help me decide, or you get to decide with right. me, or tell me what I get to say to the judge, okay? So I'm going to preview for you what I like to say to the judge, and I want you to tell me whether it's okay. And maybe you can help me add some things or make it better. Right. This is something that we asked about in that same study, yeah. Chris, and I don't have a graph, but we asked, can your attorney tell the judge what you say, tell the parents what you say, and a significant percentage of kids didn't understand what that privilege or that confidentiality met. Yeah, what the scope of right. it was and what the limits of it are. That's no, right. I think that's right. And you make a point about parents. So one of the things that I've added to my sort of litany when I'm describing this at all is I'll also say to my client, you know, I can't even tell your parents what you tell me. And I'm sure they're going to ask, but I can't tell your parents unless you give me permission. Um, so the only time that I can say something um, without your permission is if you are about to hurt yourself or you're about to really hurt someone else or you give me permission. Okay, so I, 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 I got to be honest. I got to tell them the whole thing. Um, and so um, so this is just one example. It's up on the PowerPoint for those of you who want to look at it. Um, again, it's an organic conversation with your client, but these are some of the basics that you've got to cover with a young client. And I'll say this is true even when rep representing juvenile clients in adult court. Right? The fact that they're in adult court facing adult criminal charges doesn't change the fact that they have fundamental misconceptions about who the attorney is um, and the role of the defense attorney um, for, the, for the client. Okay? So there are many other uh, uh, ways in which you can introduce yourself. I will say um, one other thing is I've learned that a number of jurisdictions use a written attorney-client retainers for young people. Perfectly fine idea, but we certainly have to make sure those, those written agreements are in adolescent appropriate language 
far too often I see written agreements, retainer agreements um, that are written for the parents of the child. The parent isn't your client, and so they've got to be rewritten in adolescent appropriate language targeted to the kid. Um, so um, you talked about the misconceptions, uh, and I'm talking to Dr. Willard here, you talked <laughs> about misconceptions um, that young people have about who their lawyer is. What are some other misconceptions um, that, that young people have about what happens in court, for example? Great question. Um, and I think just like we were talking about the very basic language of attorney and lawyer, understanding all of the players and the court process is something that is worth spending some time on and not assuming that your youth, even youth who may have been through the juvenile system before and are now in the adult system may understand. So from some of the studies that we've done looking at kids understanding and reasoning and comparing it to adults, um, and I'll show you uh, a graph and example in just a minute. But the punchline coming from that is that we do see that adolescents demonstrate lower understanding and reasoning capacities about court personnel and procedures. Okay, so again, there's variation within adolescents. You may have somebody that understands all of this, but I guess what we're saying is you can't assume that kids, particularly younger kids, at that break point of uh, 14 or 15 or younger, um, are likely not going to understand uh, out the door uh, what this might be. So let me give you an example. This comes from the MacArthur Competence Assessment uh, Tool for Criminal Adjudication. So the context is evaluating or testing capacities that are relevant to competence to stand trial. Okay? So uh, the tool looks at dimensions of understanding and reasoning and appreciation. Now, for the moment, um, I'm not interested I won't be talking about whether kids are competent or not, but I just want to show you some examples of the kinds of questions we ask, and then I'm going to show you how kids do compared to adults, right? So the understanding question, the first one here. They're given, we read them a vignette that sets up a situation about a fight between two people, Fred and Reggie, right? So we're not asking about their own case, we're giving them this. And then we carry them through questions or information that the characters might need to know as a way to understand what they themselves know about the process. So let's say that Fred's case goes to court for a jury trial. What are some of the jobs of the jury? And we leave that as an open-ended question. And we have criteria for scoring it, you know, to, to and some jurisdictions to make a decision about, you know, whether Fred is guilty or not. In some jurisdictions, they offer a sentence, you know. So we have a list, and we're looking to see if kids or adults are able to answer that correctly. Then we also have questions in this assessment about reasoning, right? So we mentioned earlier in the talk about kids probably being less likely to, to know what's important to tell the lawyer, right? What's relevant for the case. Um, they aren't able to think abstractly as well or to think ahead as to why something might be relevant or not. So here's an example. We give them two facts. At the time of the fight, Fred was frightened because Reggie was acting like a tough guy. At the time of the fight, Fred had been getting along well with his friend Julie. So then we ask, if Fred's lawyer wants to know what Fred might have been thinking at the time of the fight, which of those two things is more important to tell his lawyer? And then we say, why? Okay, so we're trying to get at whether they can understand which of those would be relevant and understand why it would be relevant, right? So it would be relevant, of course, to give some sense of what they were thinking and what the context might have been in the fight. So I mentioned this is relevant to competence. We then had a series of these questions and then scored how well kids and adults did. We had kids both that were in pretrial detention and adults who were in jail awaiting trial and a community sample of folks who were not engaged in the justice system at that point. And summing or adding up across the understanding and reasoning, what we see here, here's the percent of folks in our study at different ages that scored in the seriously impaired category of understanding or reasoning. Okay? Seriously impaired for this study and with this instrument meant um, that they were scoring comparably to adults who are found incompetent to stand trial okay, and are sent for restoration. So this is pretty serious, um, a level of misunderstanding. And you can see that this goes almost straight down, right, from age 11 down age 18 to 24. Um, the 11 to 13 year olds and the 14 to, uh, to 15 year olds are not different from each other, even though the gra they're not significantly different, even though the percentages look different. Essentially what this is saying is that from 11 to 15, 
uh, kids are much more likely to show seriously impaired understanding and reasoning compared to kids 16 to 17 and adults 18 to 24. Okay, this doesn't mean that they're incompetent necessarily, but it does mean that the assumptions we might make about their capacity to already know what's going to happen or to be able to, as you were saying, Chris, you know, to be able to say back to you, this is what you just explained to me, um, there's a much greater risk, right, like a one in three or one in four for these youngest kids that they're not going to be able to do that well. All right. Well, that's very helpful. The um, the other, we just had a couple of more things that we thought we would share by way of tips. One um, uh, tip is is recognizing that information gathering for, for example, the release argument or for disposition planning for multiple stages in a, in a juvenile or criminal case is, is a bit different um, than the, than when interviewing an adult client. Um, and I think some of this is obvious, so I, I won't spend much time on it. These are just, this goes to the content of our questions. Again, it's really important that our clients, understand that our clients don't always know what's relevant, so they don't know, um, uh, you know, what information to share regarding release. So I have to be more pointed with those clients. So for example, spending much more time on getting information about the, the child's relationships within the family, within the, uh, what are the family dynamics, including things like has the, has the family ever been to court for abuse and neglect. So you're going to have to hone in in that sort of in the T-funnel method. These are some of your narrow questions that I think I would spend more time on than I would with, with an adult client. Um, obviously, you're going to spend more time on school. Um, and, and, and in school, it's questions like um, uh, suspensions, school activities, special education, and figuring out how to ask that question in a way that's not perceived to be threatening. So some of this is just content um, uh, uh, that we wanted to share. Another point is making sure you're asking about medical and mental health um, uh, related issues with young people. And again, some of this information you'll get from their parents and other collateral contacts, but figuring out age appropriate ways, non threatening ways to ask your client some of these questions as well um, is equally important. Um, also, uh, in terms of getting information about the facts of the case. I also, again, find to be a little bit different with my adult clients. And this is actually ties into something that we've already talked about, is how to frame these questions about the facts of the, of the case in a non-judgmental way. So, um, you know, each year I, I work with my students to come up with um, non-threatening ways to ask some of the very basic questions. So if I want to learn um, about whether or not my, my, my child has been involved with, I don't really so much care whether he did it or didn't do it, but I need information about a, a case in which my child or client is charged with um, unlawful use of a motor vehicle. Some jurisdictions would call that car theft or um, joyriding, whatever you call it. Um, you know, how do I ask about that? You know, how do I ask the client um, about that? So I might ask questions like, are the police going to say that you were in a stolen car? Okay, are, are the police going to say that you were driving dangerously or recklessly? Again, I, I situate the source of the information elsewhere, right? So if they're not ready to tell me from, their, from themselves, that's fine. But I need to know what I'm walking into in the courtroom, that kind of thing. Um, uh, in, a th in a robbery case or a theft case, something of that nature, I might ask the client to say, well, do you know... Um, whether or not there was any witness who pointed you out. Do you know whether, whether the witness said that anything was taken from her or stolen from her? Really a good way to, to get information from clients. Um, so um, did you want to say something about social um, desirability? Yeah. Uh, well, we've talked about that a little bit already. Okay. So just the notion that younger kids may be more likely to want to uh, say, you know, to say what they think you want them to say, yeah, yeah. right? So they may be responding in ways that are incomplete or something like that because they're answering how you think they want you to right. answer. And also, as I understand it, uh, to, they also answer in ways that um, that make them perceived in the best light. Right. Or, or right. Yeah, make them right. appear. So in terms of disclosing things that they think you might judge 
as to be bad or, you know, anything right. like that, they might not be disclosing that information. Um, and these are, again, pretty basic questions that you need to ask your client, but a young person really perceives them often differently. I also um, always remind my clients um, in the best way I can that it's okay to change your information, that this is the first time we're talking about it. We're going to talk about it more later, and you might remember things differently. And it's okay to tell me that you remember things differently um, the next time I come see you, and I leave it at that. Um, and then I might remind them of that at the start of the next interview. Um, other tips, um, there are some concluding things. Um, how do I conclude every interview with my young client? Um, I certainly will give these warnings to my adult clients, but every interview I want to remind them of a few things. One is... Um, I don't let, let it come up on the, the slide. Um, don't discuss the case with anyone but me, not friends, not family, not co-respondents, not other kids in the neighborhood. i got to remind my client of that every time I see him. <laughs> um, say nothing to the police, nothing to, prosecute, to the prosecutors. Um, another thing I'm going to remind my client, don't sign anything requested by the police or the prosecutor without talking to your lawyer first. Me. <laughs> come see me first. Um, Another thing I might say is uh, don't consent to a lineup. I explain to the client what a lineup is. But these are just concluding tips that you're often going to give your, your adult client, but they bear reminders over and over with your adult clients. The, one of the last couple of things that I want to do is just to show you a chart um, before we end. Oh, yeah, let's jump. Um, is to show you an example of a chart. So I talked about using visual aids. Now, I might not have this pretty colorful <laughs> uh, piece of paper with me in a, in, a, in a client interview, but this idea, and I hope you can see it, um, and I understand the slides are available um, for you online, but if you look at, I might have my client help me come up with the, the strengths of the government's case. So I'm, if I'm deciding whether to go to trial or not go to trial, I want the client to tell me, help me work through. So who are some of the witnesses? And the client can tell you, a young client can work with you and tell you who the government, the prosecutor is probably going to call, right? Um, what kind of evidence, what kind of things are they going to bring into court and say that, uh, and use in their case, that kind of thing. So this is just an example of a chart. Another example of a chart is the pros and the cons of going to trial versus a, a plea. Um, again, you have this available to you, um, but these are just examples that you can create for yourself. Um, in terms of preparing the client to testify, a couple of quick tips on that. Reminding the client that the decision is theirs. Okay, um, and empowering the client, however, to make that decision, even if they are afraid. All right, so it's mooting, it's rehearsing the direct and cross examination, which we should be doing with our adult clients, but even more with our young people, and getting all the slang um, <laughs> out of, of their testimony. Um, I'm often amused at all the new words I learned while I'm preparing, prepare, excuse me, preparing a client, a young client, to testify. So um, helping the client understand when to use yes and no answers, i.e. on cross-examination, <laughs> and when not to use yes and no answers, um, such as on direct examination. And so then the very, um, uh, very last thing that I think we wanted to end with was the, was the parents. Um, and we really do want to conclude this session. I'm going to skip over the post-disposition interviews because I think a lot of this we have already covered. Um, and you can read. Yeah, so just the, sh the, the quick summary of the parent information is that parents are there, right, which they are potentially not for your adult client, and that parents and kids may have very different and both may have incorrect understandings of your role as a lawyer and around, as you were just saying, uh, Chris, you know, it's the kid's decision about whether to testify or not. Um, parents may not believe that. <laughs> yeah. So in that same interview when we asked uh, – parents and kids, what's the most important role of the defense attorney? You'll see that parents primarily thought that it was to do what the parent wanted the yeah. attorney to do. The kids were mixed on whether they thought it's what they want the attorney to do, and a few folks thought that the attorneys just did what the judge wanted them to do, which we can set aside for the moment. But here, again, where there may be conflict between the parent and the youth yeah. about what a decision should be or could be, a significant number of parents think that they should be the one to decide if the if their child disagrees with them about some aspect of the case. 
some kids think the parents should decide as well. You know, so this right. issue of where that decision making authority is located and how to empower them to do that um, is is important. And you shouldn't assume that even the parents understand the roles and the responsibilities. Right. So then what do we do about that? So the last, um, our parting words for you are, are addressing the parent-child relationship, even in adult cases. Um, uh, so the tips that we have, four tips that we have here are, one, establishing privacy and confidentiality with the youth right off the bat. So it's managing expectations with the parents, you know, telling them right off the bat, look, I'm here to represent your son or your daughter, and I have to take direction from them. I know this is uncomfortable. I know this is unusual, but that's what the law says. So I, we go through this all the time with, uh, with our young clients. Um, so we want to do that. You also may begin a meeting. Uh, by interviewing uh, both the well, about by introducing yourself to both the child and the parent together, but then quickly um, uh, separating the child away so that you have a lengthy private interview with that child. You might explain to the parent that to keep the parent in the interview could violate the attorney-client privilege or break the attorney-client privilege and lead to the parent being called to testify against the child. Um, so there are strategies that you can uh, use to, to help the client um, uh, and the parent understand why the interviews need to be uh, separate, okay? Um, you also want to get your parent to sign a release of information form. Um, and it's normal for us, it's a normal course of business for us who represent kids in juvenile cases, it's not so normal for you in an adult case. But even if your child is an adult for criminal purposes, he's still probably a child for other purposes like accessing school records, mental health records and the like, so you need a release from the parent. And so that was our, our very last, our second to the last slide, because we end with our resources. And so we really want to just thank you guys. Um, That's all right. Thank you. Um, the resources that, that one we've already mentioned is the Binder and Price book, Keep going. Um, the Binder and Price book, and another is a, an article by Michelle, uh, and actually, can I pronounce her last name? I should have worked on this. <laughs> Navinia? Um, she's that fabulous. Um, uh, uh, she's a, a fabulous linguist who has worked on language issues with, with young people. So those citations are up on your screen, and it's been fabulous. It's been fun. I learned from you. And I learned from you. Thank you. Well, thank you today to both of our speakers, Kristen Henning and Dr. Willard. We appreciate it very much. And also thank you to Catherine Crawford for all her help in organizing this. Thank you to our viewers. And please tune in tomorrow when this webcast series continues at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time with incorporating adolescent brain and behavioral development science into all stages of the criminal proceeding. And then again at 1 p.m. Eastern with strategies for keeping youth out of adult jails and prisons. Also, I'd like to remind everybody watching that for anyone who can't join us live, everybody can watch these after the fact on demand on the NACDL website. Thank you. <laughs>